Thank you for joining me today. Uh, this is Tony Elwick. Uh, for 25 years now, I've been heading up the innovation consulting company, Strategen. I'm especially excited to be here today to explain a new framework that we've been developing over the past few years. And first, I want to thank Perrin Hamilton, a valued member of our team, uh, for his contributions. What I hope to show today is that uh, disruptive innovation and other innovation strategies can be better explained and applied more predictively when seen through a jobs to be done lens. The story I want to tell begins with emphasizing some key insights uh, we've taken away from our experiences over the years. We discovered back in 1990 that Six Sigma principles could be applied to, to innovation when studying the underlying process that customers were trying to execute rather than focusing on the customer or the product. By changing the unit of analysis, this allowed us to think about innovation very differently. And this led to what is now known as outcome-driven innovation. So by heading down this path, we're able to break down that underlying process the customer is trying to execute and apply customer-defined metrics, the metrics they use to measure success and value in getting that job done, if you will. And by thinking about it that way, we're, we're able to make innovation far more predictable. Our first success came back uh, in 1992. And we've been at this for a good long time, 25 years. We've celebrated our 25 year anniversary last year. And this first success is, was very special. Uh, it proved out the process. Uh, the goal here was to help Cordis Corporation come up with a line of angioplasty balloons that would restore their market share. So what we did is we focused on the underlying process that interventional cardiologists were trying to perform, which is to restore blood flow a blocked artery. So we did that. We applied the theory and discovered the metrics they used to measure value. We conducted quantitative research to figure out which of those metrics were underserved, and we addressed them with a new set of products. Well, 18 months later, new products were released. All of those became number one or two in the market, and Cordis's market share went up from 1% to about 20%. So that was a great success. And over the years, we've really worked to fine tune this process. We've had many successes. Uh, we've worked across 30 plus industries, over 400 different companies. And through that um, time, we were able to refine the process uh, to where it is today. And we feel, feel that it's in a pretty stable state. So the way the process works is pretty straightforward. Uh, we begin by defining the market. And we think about a market as a group of people who are trying to get a job done. Once we know what that job is, we can start breaking that job down into its component parts and figure out the customer's needs. Now, what we've learned over the years is that there's five different types of customer needs. There's desired outcomes on the core functional job. There are related jobs. There are consumption chain jobs. There are emotional jobs. And there are financial metrics that people use to decide whether they want to by product A or product B. So knowing all this, we've uncovered the different variables, if you will, that, that make up the innovation equation. And once we capture them all in step three, we can be begin to quantify them. And what we do when we quantify them is we're trying to figure out which of those needs are unmet. Right, the basic premise of the whole process is that you know, we're trying to create products and services that, that address unmet customer needs. So in order to make that possible, we have to first agree on what a need is, then we have to be able to capture those needs, and then we have to figure out which of those are unmet. So when we quantify these, we ask customers the importance of each need and the degree to which they're satisfied with their ability to uh, get the job done along that dimension with the product that they're using today. Now we think about this as collecting predictive data. And the reason we say that is because if we can identify the unmet needs of today, we can predict which products in the future will succeed. They'll be the products that satisfy those unmet needs of today. With that in hand, we go to the next step, uh, step number four, where we discover hidden segments of opportunity. And the reason we say they're hidden is because they're hidden from normal view. Uh, if you look uh, at the market with demographic lens or psychographic or behavioral or attitudinal lens, if you will, you won't see these segments. 
And if we're trying to find segments of customers with different unmet needs, uh, the only way to do that, of course, is to segment around unmet needs. Now, most companies, there isn't agreement on what a need is and which are unmet. Uh, so it's very hard to accomplish that. But outcome-driven innovation addresses all those key issues. So once we know what those unmet needs are in those segments that we've discovered, we're ready to build our market and product strategy. So the first thing we do is align the current product set alongside those opportunities that we've discovered. Uh, we can message strengths. We can overcome weaknesses and so on. And in step six, we conceptualize brand new products uh, that can get the job done better or new platform level solutions that get the job done significantly better. Now, one of the key elements of all of this is the segmentation piece. And I say that's key because it really dictates the type of strategy that you can pursue as a company. And this is really going to be a key part of the framework that we'll be discussing later. Uh, this graphic here shows a market where there are three segments of customers. We see an over-surf segment on the far left. We see an appropriately surf segment with someone that needs in the middle. And we see a highly underserved segment in red on the far right. And this is pretty common. Uh, whenever we do our segmentation techniques, uh, well, we never know what we're going to find. We might find three underserved segments. We may find three overserved segments, uh, many variations. But the key here is that we have to know what kinds of segments exist before we can pursue the correct strategy. So for example, the segment over on the far left, um, that's an overserved segment. Well, if that overserved segment doesn't exist and we pursue a disruptive strategy, the chances of our success go down dramatically because there is no segment of customers that are highly overserved. By the same token, if we're going after a highly underserved segment of the market with a very differentiated high cost product and that segment doesn't exist, then our chances of success, of course, decline dramatically. And this is really the power of the approach. Uh, what we've learned over the years is that we can identify what a need is, what the needs are, which are unmet, and segments of customers that have different unmet needs. And once we've identified the target to that degree, the chances of success go up dramatically. And you can imagine this. You know, what are the chances of your company randomly coming up with a solution that addresses those 15 or so unmet needs that are shown there if they're unaware that those needs even exist. Well, the chances are pretty slim. But once we define the problem in the level of granularity that we do, uh, creating a product that's successful in the market uh, becomes much more predictable. So that's the basic premise. Uh, over the years, we've written a lot about the approach. Uh, the first book I put together back in 2005, What Customers Want, uh, really outlines the process uh, in detail and it hasn't changed a lot since then but we've certainly made good refinements to it uh, those refinements are highlighted in a new book uh, called jobs to be done theory to practice that i just put out uh, in october of, uh, of this year well it's been a long journey and uh, throughout that journey uh, we introduced the concept uh, to clay christensen back in uh, 1999 and uh, he talked about it in his book, The Innovator Solution. And this is where uh, he looked at the underlying process and saw the benefits of going down that path and uh, talked about the job to be done. That you need to focus on the underlying job instead of the process. So uh, that name stuck. And now we call it jobs to be done uh, theory and outcome driven innovation. That's the process that brings it to life. Uh, Clay also just wrote a, a new book, Competing Against Luck, where he again touts the benefits of, um, of jobs to be done thinking and how it really guides a company uh, to growth. Well, that brings me to where I want to go. Um, I want to talk about the theory of disruptive innovation. Uh, when Clay wrote this book back in 1997, it was really exciting. Uh, this was one of the, the best books ever on innovation. And the theory of disruptive innovation has really uh, taken hold in the industry. Um, everybody has heard about it. Everyone uses this. And um, it's been great watching the evolution of the theory. Now, over time, uh, people have come to, especially lately, uh, begin to criticize the theory and try to pick it apart. And, um, and you know, and unfairly in many cases. 
Now, what we started looking at uh, when this happened is, you know, is there a better way to explain this theory? And we started thinking about some of the key components of the theory. Uh, for example, uh, disruptive innovation describes a process. So, you know, we you could head down the path and say, okay, let's think about disruptive innovation as a process. Or we've you know, innovation, an innovation that's disruptive allows a whole new population of consumers at the bottom of the market access to a product. Well, if we think about it this way, then disruptive innovation is a product. And we can see where some of the confusion comes in. Um, another statement here, and all this comes from uh, Clay's uh, latest uh, on his website. So this is how the theory has evolved. And the third statement says companies pursue sustaining innovations at the higher tiers of the markets. However, by doing so, they open the door to disruptive innovations at the bottom. And people have criticized that to say, well, you can disrupt from the top as well. And you know, all the pieces didn't necessarily fit together perfectly. And of course, and the theory's been uh, evolving over time. And we thought, well, to try to make the theory better, um, maybe there's a different way we could look at this. And we asked ourselves the question, can disruptive innovation theory be better explained through a jobs to be done lens? Now, we didn't really know what that meant when we first posed the question. We thought, well, how are we going to put it through that lens? Well, we've worked on this for a good number of years, and we, and we found a way to do it. And uh, the first conclusion that we drew is that the strategy is dependent on the opportunity that exists. So you may want to pursue a disruptive innovation, but there may not be an overserved segment. And so if that's the case, what are your options? And we could raise a number of questions like that as we will through the rest of the presentation. But what we discovered is that outcome-based segmentation exposes uh, underserved, overserved, appropriately served segments, and it reveals what growth strategies will and won't work uh, in a given situation. So this thinking led to the creation of the Jobs to Be Done Growth Strategy Matrix. And we view this as a framework uh, that you can use to guide the formulation of winning strategies, growth strategies. So let's introduce this. Uh, it all began uh, with an observation. And the observation was that products that win in the marketplace either get a job done better and or more cheaply. And this is something, of course, that we've noticed over the years, and it's not very complex, but um, it seems to be true in, in every case. So we went with that as our beginning observation. And from there, we began to categorize the possibilities, given that that was our observation. And like any good consulting firm, we thought, well, let's try a matrix. So um, here's our matrix. Uh, we put these into these four categories. And, and given that you can get a job done better and or more cheaply, here are the options. We can get the job done better and charge more, make it more expensive. Uh, we can get the job done better and make the product less expensive. We could get the job done worse and make the product less expensive. And we could make the product worse, make the product more expensive. So those were the, the four options. And we thought, well, that makes pretty good sense, but let's take it another level and ask the question, to whom would these different options uh, be uh, attractive to? What types of customers? And what we determined is that there are really certain customer types that would find each of these situations to be attractive. And the first one is, making it better or more expensive, who would find that attractive? Well, if you're underserved, you would find that attractive. If you're highly underserved, you'd say, I want a better product and I'm willing to pay more to get the job done better. Makes sense. Or we may find that uh, this, uh, this uh, group over here, uh, getting the job done better and for less money, well, that appeals to everybody. Uh, whether you're appropriately served, overserved, underserved, non-consumer, uh, if you can get the job done better and cheaper, that's a, a very attractive value proposition. Another option is to get the job done worse or less. Well, who does that appeal to? Well, there's really two groups of people. Uh, one is the overserved customers, a highly overserved segment that doesn't need the the uh, the function that a product's offering, or non-consumers. Now, consumers, on the other hand, are actually underserved. Uh, they don't have the product. 
They're doing things ad hoc. So they're underserved, but maybe they couldn't afford the product before. But by making it cheaper, now they can enter the market. And of course, then there's worse and more expensive. And you say, well, would anyone pay more for worse product? As it turns out, it happens quite frequently. And this happens in situations where customers have limited options. So we'll talk about all these in more length. There's also one more category, and that's if you're in the middle of all of this, um, you may not make the product that much better or that much cheaper, but that's a, a pretty reasonable strategy to pursue. This happens all the time where you just have incremental improvement. And by doing so, you'd win your existing customers or hopefully not lose them to a competitor. So with these possibilities laid out, then we thought, well, it looks like each of these um, could work its way into its own growth strategy or dictate its own growth strategy. So we looked at each of these and said, well, uh, in the situation where we're winning underserved customers only, let's call that a differentiated strategy. We're going to help them get the job done better and charge more. We're going to differentiate ourselves uh, to such a degree that we're going to justify that possibility. And this terminology goes uh, along pretty well with you know, theory that we've heard over the years from Michael Porter and others. So we went with that as the, the name. This other group here, winning all types of customers, overserved, underserved, by getting the job done better and cheaper, we're going to call that a dominant strategy. And we choose that name because the dominant strategy always wins. And there's precedent uh, for, for that terminology. So we went with that, uh, that naming convention. Now down in the bottom right, Winning overserved customers and non-consumers, a disruptive strategy. And that is, of course, right from Clay Christensen. On the far left, uh, winning customers and limited options, we're going to call that a discrete strategy. Or we're going to come up with a product that will uh, get the job done uh, worse, and we're going to charge more. And then in the middle, with that incremental improvement where we win existing customers or hold on to them, we're going to call that the sustaining strategy. So this lays out the model. And from here, we can start explaining different situations that occur and um, how products win or lose in the marketplace. So let's get started with that. <coughs> as we do this, we're going to use products as a unit of analysis, not companies. Now, this is something that we learned as we started going through this. We can't really say that Uber, the company, has a strategy because Uber has lots of products. And each product, a different segment, if you will, an underserved segment, an overserved segment, they're using different strategies. And you can see it in their product offering. Uh, Uber Black gets a job done better, but you're going to pay more. Uh, Uber X will get the job done better than the taxi. And this, this is how they advertise as well. Better, faster, cheaper than a taxi. So it's better and cheaper. And Uber Pool um, may not get the job done as well, but you're going to pull and save money. So when we start thinking about uh, examples for each of these situations, we're going to focus at this at a product level because we don't believe you can say the company Uber uh, has a single strategy. Uh, they have multiple strategies. So looking at this as a product level and making the product a unit of analysis is, uh, is really critical. So let's get started. We'll start with the differentiated strategy. Now, of course, Lots of examples here of successes. Uh, the goal here is to get the job done significantly better, charge more money. Uh, this is a great strategy for profit share. Uh, companies who pursue this strategy can get fairly low market share, high profit share. Apple's great at this, of course, with their fairly low market share in uh, getting high profit share, anywhere from 12% you know, market share to 60, 70, 80% uh, market share uh, to profit share over periods of time. Uh, Nest has done this as well. You know, they come out uh, an, a new uh, entrant into the marketplace and, and charge seven times more than everybody else for a thermostat. Well, how many people are crazy enough to spend that much money on a thermostat? Well, it turns out about 10% of the market. But by securing that 10% of the market, they secure about 25% of the profit in that space and shake up the industry. And Dyson has done the same over the years. They have a 24% market share roughly and a 59% profit share. So this is a very profitable strategy to pursue. And if you can do this, 
these make great sense. But of course, there has to be a highly underserved segment that exists in the market before you could pursue such a strategy. Another element of this is this concept of moving down market. And I think this explains it pretty well. Down market to us means that you start uh, with a differentiated strategy. So you're getting the job done a lot better and charging more. But as you come up with the second version of your product, which continues to get the job done better and you're charging more, you lower the price on your first version of your product. And we've seen Apple do this uh, with a sequence of iPhones over the years. As it introduces a new model, it, it uh, offers the lower model at a lower and lower price. So as the third version comes out, if you will, um, the first version is finding itself placed in that other quadrant where they're now pursuing a dominant strategy with an older product. This is really an excellent way of moving down market. So you're maintaining your profit share with your new products as they get the job done better and charging more, but you're taking those old products and uh, charging a lot less money for those, allowing you to pick up the, the underserved and non-consumers as well. Very effective strategy. Let's talk next about the, the dominant strategy. Um, here, this is, of course, the way to go. If you can come up with a product that gets the job done better and more cheaply, uh, then you're going to win everybody. It's just hard to do. Uh, companies do it, though. We've seen Netflix come in and get the job done significantly better and at a lower cost to the consumer. Uh, Kroll entered the electronic evidence discovery market, getting the job done better and cheaper. Google AdWords uh, gets the job done better and cheaper. So it is hard to, to, to do, but it is possible. And if you can apply that strategy, you don't have to worry about what kind of segments exist. You just have to worry that the market exists and pursue it heartily. The example I like giving is the Curl on track. We actually worked with uh, Ben Allen and his team back in the um, early 2000s to help them disrupt that market. Uh, they attempted entry into the market twice. We helped them discover what the entire job was and put a plan in place to uh, grow the market, which they did, and they've been leading that industry for a good long time. Let's move on to the next piece, which I, I think is one of the more exciting, uh, where we talk about disruptive strategy. So, of course, there's uh, plenty of ex examples here as well. So there's two elements of the disruptive strategy, if you will. One is if it appeals to the overserved uh, segments of the market. And so if there is an overserved segment, you can apply the disruptive strategy. Google Docs does that pretty well. It gets the job done worse, but the price is right. Uh, TurboTax beats a, uh, a tax attorney or an accountant and gets the job done good enough. Uh, same thing with Dollar Shave Club. So there's many examples that we've seen here over the years. And of course, there's the other option where you target the non-consumers. So um, people who couldn't afford to go to the dentist to get their teeth whitened can now afford uh, white strips and we grow the market amongst the base of non-consumers. So all that makes sense. And these are no, nothing new here. But what I wanted to look at is, you know, can we explain disruptive theory better using this matrix? So we started looking at some of those key uh, descriptors of you know, what disruptive theory says and applied it here. So the first is, you know, an innovation that is disruptive allows a whole new population of consumers at the bottom of the market access to a product. Well, that's true for non-consumers, but not for the overserved customers. So if we're pursuing a disruptive strategy, um, we, can we can focus on the non-consumers and that's true for non-consumer, but it's not true for the overserved customers. So that's a nuance. We can also look at uh, this uh, thought as well, where we're saying companies pursue sustaining innovations at the higher tier of the markets. However, by doing so, they unwittingly open the door to disruptive innovations at the bottom. Well, this is true under a couple of conditions. Uh, one is uh, if the offerings evolve to be better, but not less expensive. So in other words, you're not moving down market. You just keep moving up market. If that condition exists and uh, there is an overserved segment, then you're opening the door to disruptive innovations at the bottom of the market. But if there is no overserved segment, 
then you're not. And if you're evolving your products down market, then you're not necessarily either. So there's ways to avoid a low end disruption by uh, securing strategies uh, in the differentiated area that would move you down market and so on. So that's uh, a few of the nuances explained there as well. The third piece is the, the process of disruption. And I find this interesting because uh, you know, disruption can be a process and we say this is true. Uh, you have a, a product that pursues a disruptive strategy that uh, falls down that lower right hand quadrant and over time that product gets better and better until it moves up into this dominant range and gets the job done cheaper as well so not only are you helping the uh, customer get the job done better over time but cheaper this is where you win the entire market this is really the power of the process of disruption so this is certainly true and this does happen as clay has described it over the years I think one thing that's been a bit confusing about all of this is the, the nomenclature that's been used to describe some of these events, if you will. And we've talked about disruptive innovation, uh, but disruptive innovation is pretty vague. And what we're going to suggest here is that we think about describing it a little differently. And let's talk about disruptive strategy, if you will, as the strategy employed for a, a specific product in a given situation. So if your goal is to target a set of non-consumers or overserved customers you're with a product, that product is employing a disruptive strategy. Let's move from there and say, well, if that product uh, is comprised of a technology platform that facilitates or enables the process of disruption to occur, then we can call that technology a disruptive technology. It's disruptive in the sense that it facilitate movement um, into the dominant strategy area. And not all, not all disruptive strategy products will do that. Uh, so for example, we may be in the retail space and you have a low-end retailer who doesn't invest heavily in infrastructure and so on, so they can sell uh, clothing very cheaply. Well, they're really gonna have a tough time moving up market, if you will, to uh, get the job done better for the highly underserved customers. So we would say in that case that that platform, even though you could use it to pursue a disruptive strategy, uh, is not a disruptive technology and therefore won't allow you to move um, through that disruptive process, if you will, up into the dominant area. In the process of disruption, I think that's, um, that's right on. It's a series of products that employ a disruptive and eventually a dominant strategy by making a cheaper product capable of getting the job done better. And I think if we think about it from this perspective, uh, we can make uh, disruptive theory, if you will, uh, be more efficient in terms of predicting how uh, technologies will move and who will be successful and who won't be successful in the marketplace. So this explains high-end disruptions, low-end disruptions, the process of disruption, and so on. The last uh, section here is on the discrete strategy. And when we first saw this section, we thought, well, the matrix isn't going to work because who's ever going to buy and pay more for a worse product? Well, it turns out this actually is a strategy and uh, many companies pursue it. So we call it a discrete strategy because it doesn't often require a brand new product. It just typically takes a product that exists and, and puts it in an area or, uh, that, where it will be uh, you know, more convenient. So typically, there's situations where a customer is either legally, physically, or otherwise restricted or constrained in how they could get the job done. Uh, I think the remote ATM is a great example. You could be an art show or a fair uh, where, uh, yeah, you have access to an ATM, uh, but you know it's certainly not the high-end model. It might be uh, void of all the function you need, but you can get cash. And of course, they're going to charge you a lot more uh, banking fee than they would if you were you know, at your local bank. We see this with payday loans as well. Uh, people who are legally restricted from getting lower cost loans are forced to pay uh, higher rates to uh, get the job done worse in many cases. And we see this with travelers too. We've all experienced this. Airport beverages, you know, and we buy them before we get on the plane and we're paying five dollars for a bottle of water uh, because uh, we're prohibited from taking the uh, beverages through security.
So we see these situations crop up where you're, you're getting the job done worse and, and paying more in many cases. Of course, this, stra- this strategy can certainly backfire as it did for uh, EpiPen. Uh, they were already an existing product and they went ahead and raised their prices. And uh, I think, you know, I guess they thought they could get away with it. But uh, I don't think this is a great strategy to pursue once you already have your product in place and you know, take the same product and, and uh, just raise the price. I think the goal here is to find those uh, matters of inconvenience, if you will, where your product, uh, uh, you could charge more for your product and, and justify it reasonably. The uh, last piece here is the sustaining, sustaining strategy. And of course, I think we're all familiar with this. This is just getting the job done a little bit better and or a little bit cheaper. And once we're in the marketplace, this is typically a strategy that most companies pursue. And this is a very valid strategy. So uh, there's nothing wrong with this, uh, but you still have to be a bit clever in, in how you go about it. Uh, as you become more commoditized, it's harder to find the opportunities that exist to to sustain and uh, keep your market share. But we had a great example of this uh, with Bosch uh, entering the North American circular saw market with a circular saw. No, not a very new product. It's been around for years. And uh, in order to uh, use that sustaining strategy and get the job done just a bit better than their competitors, uh, we used our outcome-based segmentation to find a segment of finished carpenters who struggled to get the job done as they had to make long angle cuts and we discovered 14 unmet needs in that segment and they designed their product to address those 14 needs in that segment and that's how they won that space so um, a, a very valid strategy and of course pursued by many companies well that sums up the the, the different approaches right we could pursue a differentiated strategy by going after customers with a product that we're going to that's going to get the job done a lot better but at a higher price point. Uh, we can pursue a dominant strategy and, and address the needs of all consumers, um, non-consumers, underserved, overserved, by getting the job done better and cheaper. Uh, we could pursue a dis- disruptive strategy if a overserved segment of customers exists or if non-consumers exist in the marketplace. And we can pursue a discrete strategy if we can find a situation in which our customers are constrained in which they uh, could use our product. And then, of course, the sustaining piece. The key to all of this, uh, of course, is the segmentation. And this is what we concluded. The segments that exist in the marketplace are really going to dictate the strategy you can pursue. If there is no uh, overserved segment, you can't pursue a disruptive strategy. And if there's no highly underserved segment, you can't pursue a differentiated strategy. So having these insights is really what makes the innovation process more predictable and allows you to build out your growth strategy in a way that um, increases your chances for success. Well, is this a good theory? Well, we think it is, and we uh, evaluated it against this set of criteria here. Um, Does it help us organize and categorize things? Does it help us predict future events, explain past events? Does it give us a sense of understanding of what causes these events and can we control them? Well, we think uh, the answer is yes, but we'd like you to be the judge and to think about the framework and use it in the uh, in the weeks and months to come. Well, uh, that is it for today. I hope you find that helpful. Um, I've, um, if you'd like to keep in contact, uh, you could follow me on Twitter. You could contact Stratagen at info at stratagen.com. I've also set up a, uh, an email, uh, asktony at strategen.com. Uh, so if you have any questions about the matrix, about strategen, about outcome-driven innovation, feel free to reach out, and uh, I'll be happy to get back to you. Well, I wish you good luck in putting this framework to use and using it to make your success uh, in innovation more predictable. Uh, thank you.